somehow uh, we can claim that it's actually not side effects that are meant to be the core of the architectural concerns uh, right now. And I will try to, to go case by case on some cases. So in the case of Angela, um, it's using this type of examples uh, of Dran Graham or, or Jebo or uh, Diggers Confidio, uh, somehow to address the idea of how to expose things that are not that evident. So, and somehow the glass, the glass houses and the idea of exposure are, are connected. And, but and I will claim that is not that evident because glass doesn't mean transparency in a way. So the glasses are, could be reflected, uh, there will be uh, transparency, but not necessarily. So somehow you are connected the idea of, of uh, glass to the uh, idea of uh, how to expose the intimate into the exterior, how to expose the, those spaces that are neglected and forgotten to make it at the core of the architectural works, and how to talk, uh, that was a bit more difficult for me to grasp the uh, atemporality somehow, how works of art that are meant to be atemporal somehow are uh, actualized uh, with the idea of fashion or with the idea of their own use. And, Somehow, I wanted to connect this idea of expose with the idea of overexposure, um, and connect it maybe to the uh, moment in which we are, uh, that you could claim that excess of information, uh, somehow we live in an era of over-information, or, or excess of uh, and overexposure. So you have to think about the social media, and how we are continuously sharing images and sharing uh, our own persona, our own activities, and being overexposed in different platforms, and what it means for uh, architecture as well. Um, so in the case of, of uh, Felipe, um, I wanted to maybe start with you, because you have beautifully uh, unpacked the latest exhibition of the Latin American architecture. And somehow your argument is that there is uh, a curatorial approach that differs from the previous one uh, in 1955, and in which maybe the curatorial uh, process or the curatorial um, statement was more clear than uh, now. And, but we have been always uh, accusing somehow or uh, institutions of the capacity to uh, create uh, histories. Um, and a lot of practices that I can uh, talk about, for instance, Felicity Scott, that is a scholar dealing with the um, history of MoMA. And uh, in particular, dealing with the idea of how MoMA has ca created some canons of architecture and main discussions of histories of architecture and how other scholars are have been trying to create uh, other modernism, other stories of the uh, mo um, art modern architecture. So in this case, uh, you could uh, try to understand if Barry Bertol wanted to counterbalance that idea of the MoMA setting the agenda of what uh, Latin American architecture might be. And uh, in that sense, open it up to different voices and not trying to, um, to work with very few examples, but rather with a multiplicity that makes it difficult to come up with a, only one agenda, and rather to different agendas. So I, I, in a way, I'm curious about how do you position yourself as well between these two approaches to curatorial uh, work and to institutionalize uh, work, how do institutions institutionalize and create a particular discourse? So if you have the example of 55 and you have the example of 2015, both of them seem somehow problematic in a way. So would you be able to uh, <coughs> with your thesis to offer in a third way or could you try to, to elaborate a bit more what do you think uh, could be the success or failure of the, these two models? Uh, okay. Uh, uh, excuse me, because uh, my answer is in Spanish. 
que es, sí, que traducimos si quieres. ¿eh? Bueno, no, primero entiendo perfectamente la pregunta, eh, pero prefiero que hablarlo en español, que me, me es mucho más fácil de desarrollarlo que, que en inglés. Le pido disculpas a Susana, que no. I understand. Okay. Yo comprendo. Muy bien. Y al resto también, mil disculpas, pero prefiero porque me, me expreso mucho mejor en así, Pero entiendo perfectamente la pregunta. Bien. Eh, bueno, un par de temas que me, me gustaría hablar es. Eh, en realidad, eh, la última exposición de arquitectura latinoamericana eh, eh, tiene una visión eh, pluricomisarial, digamos en el cual Barry Perdón era el principal y después existían distintos eh, representantes de, de cada uno de los, de, de los sectores de Latinoamérica. Eh, sin duda, eh, eh, esa comparación que hago con Hitchcock no quiere decir que, eh, que una sea la correcta y otra no, y tampoco quiere decir que eh, la visión actual sea solamente en arquitectura, sino que la, la, la visión eh, plurico eh, con, mis, eh, con muchos comisarios tiene que ver con eh, la actualidad de las exposiciones. O sea, eh, hace 60 años eh, lo, lo, los, los curadores o los comisarios eh, en general eran un historiador que sabía sobre el tema y planteaba una cosa. Aparte de eso me parece que también tiene que ver mucho con que en realidad los medios, o sea, los medios de comunicación o los medios de... De, de información a los cuales eh, nosotros tenemos acceso ahora son completamente distintos a los que se tenían en, eh, en el 55 cuando Hitchcock hace el viaje a Latinoamérica en el cual en Estados Unidos evidentemente no se tenía conocimiento de la arquitectura latinoamericana mismo en las, en las críticas que se le hace eh, bueno, en las repercusiones de la, de la exposición hablan de que se fascinan con las fotografías de la arquitectura moderna latinoamericana ¿no? entonces en ese sentido me parece que son dos visiones completamente distintas, pero sin duda ninguna, eh, ni, ninguna es mejor una que la otra, sino que son contextos completamente distintos. Lo que, lo que sí me parece a, a resaltar es que eh, en la última exposición eh, el MoMA toma, aparte de relaciones que tienen que ver con quizás la política o la economía o, o la tendencia que va hacia Latinoamérica, eh, como que aprovecha el, el, el envión, digamos, o lo, el marco en el que nos encontramos, que tiene que ver con, evidentemente, con, con algunas de las cosas que Barry Bardo habla en el catálogo, que tiene que ver con Aravena, ¿no? habla de Aravena, habla de las intervenciones urbanas de Medellín, eh, que también Aravena ahora, bueno, dirige la arquitectura y la vida de Venecia. ¿no? Entonces, en ese sentido, me parece que eh, en lo que tiene que ver con la sobreexposición, eh, el MoMA, en estos cinco puntos que intenté explicar, el MoMA aprovecha el envión, aprovecha la, 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 el boom latinoamericano y pone en realidad eh, esa institución se pone en el centro del debate con el poder político y económico que tiene, evidentemente pero aprovecha esa situación para eh, ponerse en el, como en el medio de la discusión eh, críticas Ahí se pueden citar algunas críticas que tienen que ver con, bueno, en realidad se aprovecha, se aprovecha de un medio, que en realidad está bien. Y por otro lado también se, puede, se podría decir que en realidad eso, a, a ese museo que nosotros añoramos, como que es de, de vanguardia, digamos, y que pone en el debate algunos temas que eh, en unos momentos fue como el, el, el precursor, ahora en realidad, con esta lectura que yo hago, tiene que ver con reinterpretar algunas cosas que ven en el medio y las aprovecha y las pone nuevamente en el, en el debate internacional. So in that sense, if I understand correctly, because I think in your presentation there are some topics that somehow are connect to other the other presentations. So in that sense, I would say that this uh, inclusive, inclusive uh, idea of uh, bringing so many hundred hundred and eighty. Uh, uh, hundred and eight. 88 uh, works um, with no filters somehow, as you can claim. I'm not following your argument. You so you know that there are no filters, that there are like forced relations, and there is a, an idea that uh, it's not a strong line of curatorial line, but multiple. Somehow, I will uh, say that you make a critique somehow of that, or at least you want to investigate it further, what it means also in the context of socio-cultural and also economic context uh, and political context in connection to, 
to Latin America. At the same time, somehow this the same type of conditions are the one that we claim for Arctic sexual themselves. Uh, that has to be inclusive, that has to be you no know, filters, no hard lines of thought, that you have to embrace like uh, uh, different voices uh, and etc. Um, maybe also the idea of originality plays a, a role in that, but maybe we can take it further. So uh, connected to this idea of exposure and overexposure, um, I think somehow this could be connected. So do you think that the uh, role of the curators of MoMA in bringing different type of uh, conversations about Latin America and somehow are connected to uh, your idea of uh, bringing new understandings of uh, architectural works? Mm, yeah, it could be, but I think that uh, uh, it's more about, uh, in this case, in the Graham case, about the um, artistic uh, perversion of the real scale, of the uh, real situation of uh, the housing, and um, maybe the superexposure of the MoMA exhibitions. It, it's more about uh, uh, it's more practical in in a critical or theoretical uh, situation. And Dan Graham is more about uh, how we can do it in, in architecture. How can we build a different situation? Or um, how can we imagine, imagine a Big Brother shows um, and other, other spaces? You talk about art with um, minuscule, no? Yeah. Low, uh, low, low capitals. Uh, how low capitals? How do we should we understand in the context of your works, because you are presenting works by Jeff Walls, we are Dan Graham, Peter mm -hmm. Philip Johnson. So how do we understand what you mean by that particular understanding of? of uh, so uh, in, uh, in one hand, we will have the metaphorical art, no? that uh, it's more like um, Velázquez uh, pictures, and on the other hand, uh, we have uh, mm, perversions or other uh, architectures, other uh, artistic uh, works that uh, we can bring to to real real world. I mean, Graham's. It's also building uh, some pavilions that uh, you can. You can enter, you can see it, you can live in. And I mean that it's not a, a, a metaphorical artistic work like uh, the, one, the one of the um, Enlightenment uh, time. I'm mean, like trying to, 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 uh, try to speak what I'm trying to do, that maybe uh, it's complicated, but um, if we understand that the papers that you presented were somehow connected um, by chance, <laughs> but uh, under a, a, a topic. Um, let's try to focus on see if that possibility is actually uh, there, that saying that these side effects, uh, how can architecture be understand from these side effects? So somehow I see in your presentation this idea of the art, and this idea of exposing things that are not that evident. In your case, there is somehow uh, also a reflection of what it means that this curatorial approach, that is not that this hard line of curatorial. Um, in uh, Ignacio, uh, this idea of the architect as editor, that is not the, kind of the person that is illuminated by uh, an idea, but rather finds its evidences and finds inspirations among existing uh, works in the city. And, and and maybe uh, in the case of the video games as well, uh, this idea of how to put value or, or understand of work with ideas of a of a representation that could be a representation of architecture. So in some cases, your case I think is a bit different. Uh, in some cases, we are dealing with uh, aspects of architecture that were that are you know, hidden or not discussed or not and. 
can we claim that this is actually at the core of architectural practice today? That is just the fact that you are interested in all these questions means that somehow this is a common uh, conversation and discourse. And uh, then we are trying to see like even places like MoMA or places like even Read the Glass House as an art with uh, uh, minor letters. Like, so I, I wanted to ask you maybe more broadly uh, about your, the connection of your projects with this idea and if it's something that could be a common conversation. May I add yes, something? Please. Yes, because um, I was remember about an article that uh, Beatrice Colmina wrote which is called exactly Double Exposition, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, where she gives the example of the okay. grand project mm -hmm. for a suburban uh, house. Um, and exactly because um, she considers the house, the, in, in the Grams project, the house is seen as media. So he brings the, tev the television, the TV, uh, which may also be the video game or something that has to do with the multimedia and the, the, the digital platform inside of the house that make it uh, outside, make it an exterior. Uh, and as you may be familiar with Colomina's um, kind of thinking, you know, he, um, she's, she says that uh, exactly the, the MoMA and the, with the, its uh, international exhibition on modern movement is the, the first time uh, and this kind of uh, fundamental where modern architecture becomes really modern because it uh, has, uh, it, um, it starts with uh, the exhibition at the moment. So um, we, we might uh, try to, to, to think or, or maybe it's, um, it's important here to discuss uh, also, um, in the case of the Latin American exhibition, which is um, a big problem for me, for instance, is that a uh, kind of detachment that it happens to a lot of exhibitions today. Or it means that um, curators today need to um, to know and know um, really deep now, the matters they are uh, exposing or translating or editing uh, to a public that uh, is uh, strange to the matters or to the <coughs> contents. And somehow in this translation, sometimes uh, the real meanings or the meaning it has in place you now is somehow lost. You know? And uh, what I find uh, in the um, Today's exhibitions, for instance, would deal with the Latin American uh, architecture. Is this kind of lost in translation? Somehow it disappears. It's not uh, about the multiplicity of points of view, because of course everything is a, multipl a multiplicity. Uh, even a, a kind of thinker who has a, a line of thought or a style, even an architect who has a body of work, we can um, differentiate. Know, the different uh, things, the different uh, references, etc. Uh, so it's not about the, the multiplicity of the points of view uh, within a certain work, but it's about the the what happens um, in the in the um, in the objective space, or what happens in Latin America, and then uh, what is shown in uh, in MoMA in New York. Even if you can distinguish uh, between what is like this a space in Latin America and MoMA, uh, or can we claim that it's not a distinction anymore? And so, so another question that to me should be also on the table, because in many of your conversations uh, where this idea also the video games, like this idea of like a virtual space and then some sort of reality, while if we take further the idea of media, somehow the, the distinction between the real world and the digital is no longer possible, but they somehow are intertwined. Uh, so um, what struck me about your presentation, for instance, in the video games, was the beautiful uh, uh, floor plan of the space. And I would 
somehow encourage you to, to continue looking at, at those type of architectures in a way that uh, how, what can we learn from architectures that don't have a toilet and are all constructed by uh, corridors. And I don't know what it means, but uh, I'm for sure don't think that it's a representation of another thing or have a different category uh, in relation to field architecture. Because both of them are in continuous dialogue this one is not possible without the other, so they inhabit the space. Um, any person that will be playing a, a video game is actually inhabiting somehow these two worlds at the same time. So I think in that sense, it's no longer possible to isolate one from the other, but maybe it will be an effort to understand both of them. In the same case, trying to claim that it's an existing outside reality from MoMA that MoMA doesn't acknowledge, uh, somehow is, uh, complicated uh, question again about like then uh, what we are talking about like well, what uh, what is the the role of also of the curator or the role of, of the architect in, in this sense I will ask you for instance that you were claiming in, in a way your uh, how do you distinguish the role of uh, cool has in the New York, New York you put him as a first as an editor then somehow you bring also the idea of the critic and we can claim, I don't know, there will be the same, an editor and a critic, that will be a, a, maybe a point to discuss. But also, um, why do you call it an editorial project and not somehow an editorial uh, way of working and not a projectual one directly? Um, well, that, has, mm, that is very related to, to, the, mm, to the exposition that you were uh, claiming on um, uh, modern architecture, which um, you were saying that uh, modern architecture wasn't modern until they put it into an exposition, they said it was modern. And here, um, the, the role of the architect as a projector and uh, the role of the architect as an editor uh, comes uh, really uh, together. Uh, because uh, when, when they are uh, editing or criticizing, um, it's not the same thing, but uh, I, I use it in a very similar way because the, the work of uh, editing is a work of processing and of um, working with something that already exists and that you are not uh, creating by your own, you're, you're working with it as uh, the critic does and that was what, why I was exposing it uh, from the uh, literary criticism because they try to create or they try to do a creative work by criticizing an, an already done and finished work. Um, and in the, in, in, this, in the case of Kulhas, I think he, uh, from the beginning, he knows that he is uh, working at, at, at the same time in both ways. And uh, he's um, really aware of the power that the curator or the Critic uh, as reads in, in, in the 60s, in the 70s, and he thinks that uh, um, doing what he does, uh, he, he uh, put in the same figure uh, two things that uh, already Tafuri uh, what was uh, in saying that was in, in the case of Tafuri he was saying that it was dangerous because was putting the critic or, or the one who is, um, I think he, he says, legis legislating, the one who's telling how to do things, or, or the one who is uh, pointing what's the, what's the way to do, um, and at the same time doing it. So um, I think he, he already, from the beginning, knows uh, that he's doing both works at, at the same time. Um. I wanted to, to just to say that uh, I don't know if the, the title uh, collateral effects uh, um, it's capable of bringing uh, together the, the, the five of them and, and your presentation. Uh, certainly, the group of papers and, and your presentation uh, they they uh, happily come together within within a certain area of, of inquiry. Certainly, uh, and I think it has also to do with what you said yesterday that. Uh, we were yesterday here late uh, uh, lamenting uh, the fact that we have nothing to do. So, uh, that, uh, that the main realm of architecture has been, I don't know, stolen. 
you know, whatever happened, we went into crisis, you know, whatever it is that happened, that, that we are in, in this sort of a trip around the world trying to find uh, uh, important things to do or useful things to do, you know, trying to deploy ourselves properly in, in things which have to do with architecture, but we're not before, you know, exactly the area in which architects uh, used to work. Uh, and I think that Angela and, and, and Gaitka um, have uh, identified two, which is uh, the uh, turning, turning an architecture into art. Uh, I don't. I, I disagree with you in the in the in the capital letter. I, I think it, uh, your examples are with capital letter, um, but uh, certainly they they uh, literally deconstruct architecture to uh, mechanisms of, of uh, uh, art making. And, and the, the question is whether you are living a, out uh, uh, Gordon Mataplak purposely or not, because it would it would make your your capital letter. Uh, uh, maybe not even written down because he doesn't talk about uh, uh, mm, architecture from outside, the architecture from inside, you will not have that problem. But certainly, specifically within the domestic realm, the work of uh, the, 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 the techniques of not the, work, the techniques of uh, 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 Mata Clark have a lot uh, to do with, with your mirror that splits the house in two. Mm, in his case, more literally, more architecturally, the house cut it in two. As in Gatka, I think uh, I really uh, uh, enjoy the idea that uh, you know, the truth is that we have reclaimed that job for ourselves. No? If you want to make a digital game, uh, you need an architect because somebody has to draw the bathrooms. No? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know people killing people in digital games had to go to the bathroom. I guess. <laughs> out of bad conscience, so you, you have to throw out because you've killed too many. But, uh, you know, whatever it is, it's true that uh, that this, uh, th this moment in which uh, uh, the, the digital game tries to make things so realistic that it, it seems real, that's part of the emotion. However, the game, we know it's, it's uh, fully unreal. And that, that in this lack of distinction between Hyperrealism and 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 uh, completely unreal, completely fictional. Uh, uh, I think it gives you an, uh, uh, an input. As Marina is asking you, so what other things are not in a digital building because they are not needed, like the toilet, or what things are needed? Uh, they are needed a lot of corridors. Uh, it, it looks like a, like a 18th century plan from a, a British house where uh, servants go different from, from the, the, the Duke of, or the Duchess of, of Canterbury because they, they don't mix, you don't mix people. You need a lot of corridors because you need a lot of narratives. You need to, you need to move a lot because you have to build a story. So the, the movement is narrative, narrative is uh, architecture, etc. And I think I agree with uh, uh, what she said about uh, being more literal about what things those architects that work for digital games, for digital uh, uh, companies, uh, think that is needed as opposed to not needed, what's real and what's not real, what's realistic or functional. In, in a, and, and the other, the other uh, I mean, Su Susanna, we, 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 you place yourself a little bit on the edge of, yes. of, of the group. Because it's true that uh, uh, the body and, 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 and the movement of the body, the dynamics of, of, uh, of the body is, is on the side, of, on the edge of architecture. But, uh, but let me say it's more classical as, a, as an approach. Uh, however, uh, um, Felipe and, and, and Ignacio, together with, with, uh, with you, basically uh, talk about these um, the, the substitution again of, of reality for its reproduction. It's, it's, and in the case of uh, it's either the, ed the, the architect as editor that, that recreates architecture through images or books or, or, or messages or blogs, etc., exhibitions, we realize that you know, the, the funniest thing is that you didn't question why would you have to make a Latin American exhibition when the architecture is just the same all around the world. So 
are we going to keep uh, uh, track of this continent distinction like if we were uh, Christopher Columbus? Mm -hmm. Or are we acknowledging the 21st century, as you can see for yourself, it doesn't make no difference where you're born. You never know where you're going to end. So, so things move, and as move as the pavilions. Uh, uh, and, and it's funny because it, it, it has a lot to do, I think, not just with the exposure, and the exposure is the lack of patience. Is that things do not last. It's fast food, fast architecture. They said, what happens with the pavilions? It's not just the cafe. It's that, uh, that the architecture, even the ephemeral architecture, seems to last too long. So they have to dismantle this, and in a way, it has to, even something that is ephemeral has to start his life, its life uh, every six weeks. So I think, you know, you know I understand that that's why we are looking for a new job. Uh, because it's nothing more permanent than architecture, no matter what we say. And, and nothing that we're talking about uh, is not ephemeral. And even, our, even, even the most sort of, uh, 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 the, the problems of architecture, like, like this thing of the lightness and the future or the, or the new in, that is, is embedded in, in, uh, in the serpentine uh, 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 pavilions, people get bored of it in three weeks. So there's nothing that doesn't get uh, aged and, and dismantled and sent to the south of France like old British citizens. That when they grow old, they sell them to south of France or south of Spain. So they leave a nice end of their lives out of the, uh, of, of, of the view. And, and I think it's, it's amazing is that we consume things so quickly that uh, I don't know what we're going to do. I'm sorry. I'm, getting to the, my, my <laughs> position of old architect, but uh, I don't know, the architecture doesn't move, architecture waits, architecture lasts, architecture is heavy. I think that there's uh, also uh, some of the speakers that were talking about some sort of resistance and uh, the possibility of architecture somehow addressing other questions and um, so within that fast uh, food architecture and fast speed, um, we have to remain or remind that things also last. So what I was trying to say was like, there are processes that seem to be ephemeral and yet have permanent uh, consequences. So in the sense, uh, in your case, Susana, yet it's a bit uh, in the periphery of the conversation and not, I think this idea of the blocks of space and body is, is quite uh, fascinating and at the same time to me it is very regulated, no? like how yeah, you could like, claim that uh, such a thing exists and, um, but in that sense I will uh, ask you your idea of the body because also we are exploring the sides of the disciplines, ideas of curation and, and editorial uh, and video games, and, and suddenly in, in your case, the body is represented by this ideal body of the dancer, um, which allows you to make uh, different arguments and um, beautiful uh, statements. And at the same time, I was trying to understand what other types of bodies um, we should include. So the disabled body, the sick body, questions about gender, so how, what will mean for that uh, block body space? Mm, what will happen if we start having a more complex conversation about not the ideal body and the fit body of the dancer, but other bodies? Well, my, my focus is not the, the ideal body. What I try to explain is exactly how these, uh, the, the block of space body allows uh, to create a sensation. So the focus is the sensation. Uh, it is created in case of architecture with blocks of space body, for instance. Uh, you have the same the sensation of lightness in some of uh, Magritte's work. Uh, but that sensation, it's not created with blocks of space body, but with lines and colors, what mm -hmm. lines things. So in case, in case, for example, of um, loose houses, um, it's exactly the, the, um, when, he, when, he, um, when he composes the home plan, for instance, which the home plan is for definition blocks of space, of space body because 
he, he experiments, he actually uh, experiments all of the body postures. If I am sit with my turn back to the window where the light comes in, what are my movements? So that's why I try to uh, think uh, from the, the, the example of the dancer. So it's not the idea of, uh, it's not uh, <coughs> an ideal body. Of course, the dancers always have fantastic bodies, and they are they, they are able to express movements at very limit that uh, we, with our common bodies, cannot. But also Loz, for instance, and if you are familiar with Loz, he loved to dance. He used to flirt with uh, several dancers. He drew a house with Josephine Baker, and so on, so on. But he is very it's very uh, objective when he, 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 um, he draws a space when he thinks about how, how the person inhabits that space. But it has to do with the sensation created. If, if he wants to impress a sensation of discomfort, for instance, uh, up in a body, he, he does. He creates it. No? But it's, it has to do with sensation and not the body. Mm -hmm. But you need the body and the, the actually it, you need the body and the space in order to the sensation fills the interval or the gap. Uh, for instance, when you were um, talking about serpentine pavilions, it actually that uh, I did part of my PhD research at uh, the Peter Zunters mm -hmm. office exactly when he was uh, designing the serpentine pavilion, and it's funny because the the question of the cafe. It was the first time that uh, the, the, the Serpentine Pavilion didn't have a cafe. Mm. And it was an, an imposition by Peter Sutter mm. himself. And he had to um, negotiate it with, the, with the Julie Payton uh, because what he wanted to achieve with the pavilion, it's again the, the, the question of sensation. He wanted to build um, a garden, uh, a walled garden, and he didn't want to have any interference. He just wanted to a place to sit, to contemplate the garden. And the garden was designed by Pieter Adolf, as you say. And all, for instance, all the flowers and plants were carefully numbered uh, in order to, if, you, if uh, when the, the, the pavilion travels, to have um, an assemble again, to have the right position of the plants and everything. But the action, but the, the problem was that um, he thought, how is it possible? How can I build a certain sensation in these cases uh, of contemplation? How can I build a, a garden to contemplate? And what it does is quite uh, similar to loss. It prepares the body. Yeah, so he draws the dark corridor around the garden, and you're say, yeah, you meant, when you enter the, the space, mm -hmm. you have kind of this um, dark uh, surface, which he has texture. You know, he, and he was very careful when he thought about the texture of the hall, and he was at the site construction saying to the, to the workers, no, I want that quantity of, uh, of paint and not that one, because I want to feel the 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 the, uh, the texture of the linen that is um, at um, uh, which is paneling the, the wood the structure so it's kind of he regulated everything so the, what I say I'm trying to say is that he was worried about the sensation and what the type of sensation the action of the sensation happened body everybody. A feminine, a masculine body, everybody. It, it's, it's not about, uh, it's, uh, um, it's about uh, a very physical action that sensation has up in our bodies. No, no matter uh, where do you come from, like uh, Louise was talking about, what are your cultural roots, or your gender, or your uh, political ideas, no matter what, it's a physical action. If I'm in at the right of the end, I disagree earth. with that. But to me, what is interesting is that uh, we were trying to rethink also the body today. At least that's what I yes, yes. noted. So um, I think more most of us we are uh, navigating a terrain that is between uh, theory and criticism somehow because 
Um, in some cases, we go into history, in my case, recent history, so I'm not, but in some of your cases, uh, you are always, there is not that clear that it's a historical project, even if you look at history, but you are trying to theorize uh, your findings. So the, the, you are navigating a space that is not a uh, um, historical paper, like a, or it is not just a work of criticism, or it's something in between that is trying to theorize. And the, to me, the opportunity that you have, like if you think about the body today, um, maybe it would be more interesting to me uh, that to look at those examples that are more contemporary because if you go back to laws, probably you also will encounter a body that uh, is connected to that particular historical moment. Um, so there are questions at stake today that cannot be disconnected from the question of the body. So from now that we will have the Olympic Games in, in uh, some months, in a month, uh, and uh, then you will see how also the idea of the body uh, has changed over the years and how the body of the athlete actually has changed and uh, allowing for prothesis or allowing for uh, different different uh, ways of transforming the idea of body. So in that sense, I will argue that I don't know if everyone will be included in that effect that the Punter was expecting to, to provide with the serpent and pavilion. Um, actually, this will be another conversation, but he's trying to stage a kind of a phenomenological, a phenomenological project in, within a context that is completely contaminated by the forces of like uh, the uh, art uh, market. Uh, so the fact that this project also will be uh, reassembled and assembled in a different condition somehow questions also the idea of that uh, uh, courtyard or patio or garden that probably will be assembled in a different way with the same plants, even if we don't know exactly where it will be planted. So in a way, I think uh, it is not that easy to not to rethink the body in, in, in that particular space, as we are rethinking the role of the architect. And that's not that easy, but I think we have this opportunity that we will not probably finish today to rethink if uh, editor and critique and architects are the same figure or not, or we should make a line, distinguish one of them, if Kulhais is operating as a critic or editor, or is operating this as an architect while, uh, while looking at Manhattan and, and finding these uh, evidences, um, and uh, the role of the curator. So I think it's an unstable terrain that probably uh, requests to be a bit precise about the categories that we are using and the terms that we are using and how we position them in a particular historical context, uh, where it is in the age of uh, where Laws was doing uh, his project or, or today. And I think that somehow applies the same, like uh, how do you understand the role of a curator in the 50s and, and today and what we can learn from that? And probably you have other questions that I don't want to... Can I ask a question? I thought it was interesting uh, now hearing you talk about uh, Sumator's Serpentine Pavilion uh, because there we have a, a kind of resistant architect mm -hmm. against the kind of, uh, you know, Costa Coffee or Fortnum and Mason, pardon me, you know, and these kinds of interests, right, that in sponsoring kind of art exhibitions and, and capitalizing from that. I wanted to ask you, actually, about... Um, uh, in your research about the Serpentine Pavilions, you mentioned that a number of real estate developers were collecting these uh, these pavilions. I guess we could say they're art collectors. It's um, the same figure, somehow. Yeah, but did you ever look if you know who are the architects that these real estate developers are actually hiring to do the buildings? You know, the heavy immobile. Uh, permanent, more permanent buildings uh, that they presumably uh, are in the main business uh, of, of doing? Uh, that's a beautiful question. I think in some cases... The I'm sure it's not the same architects. It's, it's meant to be the same, but it didn't work that well. Oh. So there are a lot of histories of uh, yeah, alliances between these real estate uh, magnates and the architectural field. Um, but in the case also, for instance, of Toyo Ito, uh, Toyo Ito was not involved in the different uh, uh, iterations of this project. 
So he uh, work um, Victor Huang worked with uh, Cecil Balmont, who uh, was advising the project, but for instance, the architects didn't take part. So most of the cases, in this case of the Serpentine, the architectural office, they somehow distance themselves from what happens to the buildings after they are sold. So that's why the buildings all also have different names, and somehow they are the, the reassemble uh, assembly process is not managed by the offices. So how this another architecture, um, and it's also connected to maybe the needs of, of um, this uh, the needs of, of this other type of developments, and don't necessarily align very much with uh, the. Uh, the interest profile. of the architectural offices or the opposite. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so sometimes you just need something that triggers. So it's more important for them to just have a little piece that triggers attention, public, uh, like social media, media in general, around our, our real estate uh, uh, development, that actually having the uh, star architect designing the, the big developments. It's just they are act as so they, uh, they design the advertising pavilion yeah. or the so advertising what adds campaign. Value, somehow adds value to uh, uh, another by more banal. Uh. Mm -hmm. In that sense, um, well, thinking about those pavilions that you were, not, not the serpentine ones, but the one before that you were uh, presenting that they were traveling all around the world. Um, the question of autonomy, you, you were saying that they were autonomous from the ground, they, they, they were free in that sense, but at the same time uh, you you show us that they are um, just the opposite in, in, an ideolo in an ideological or political way because they are uh, very engaged to the, um, the hiring company or the hiring uh, cons um, corporation. Uh, they have to represent um, the, the client. You know? Coco, the Chanel Pavilion uh, is um, commissioned to Zaha Hadid because her, his, her architecture can represent uh, that institution or, or the IBM technology or uh, all the institutions. Mm -hmm. So at the same time, they are. Uh, we, we think in those pavilions as very free architecture in which um, the architects can do whatever they want. As, as you were saying yesterday, this uh, very free architecture um, at the same time, they are not as free as they can be. They are very engaged to the, to the interests of, of the planet. Yeah, that's no, totally and also in terms of purely design. If you think about also the collection of the serpentine pavilions, there are patterns that are repeated over time. So you can identify eggs, you can identify. Like, so it's a certain catalog of forms that have been used. Also to the point like Herzog and Meron were like collecting all of them and making part of their design. So this idea of uh, the pavilion as a site of experimentation for architects, somehow I can, I will want to put it um, on, on hold and try to understand what type of experimentation we are talking about. For instance, if it's a technical advancement or what type of uh, new ideas about architecture we can find in the new building by big that is now the certain type pavilion. Um, so you can actually, can my, my idea about the connection between architecture and land somehow is that there are, have been a lot of attempts to liberate architecture from the ground, whether it is projects by Constance or like in which like, or modern architecture, you have to think about um, the pilotis, no? this idea of like what it means to liberate somehow that land and obviously it, it's not uh, connected somehow always, but there are these attempts to create a different plane of operation that somehow allows architecture to set, create the other type of set of, of rules <coughs> that might not be connected to the complexity somehow that are uh, inherent to the idea of the land and the ground and ideas about borders, ideas about like uh, land ownership, etc. So you can trace those attempts especially in the 60s and 70s, uh, also with uh, ideas about outer space. Um, so I'm somehow interested in this idea of like architecture that somehow try to avoid or have a different relationship with the ground that is not permanent, but rather is temporary, or is actually trying to, to be distant uh, uh, from it. 
and what other types of uh, real estate and material conditions are, are being generated around those. So if you think about the spaceship as a traveling architecture, also obviously has very important material consequences and is also a reflection of things that happen on Earth. So the connection is still in the, of a floating body in the middle of a space with the land and the ground is still very, very physical and very uh, strong. So that's, that's where uh, my interest maybe like... Uh, I have a question for you, Marina, because I was, it's related to what you are talking about now and also what uh, Luis to, was talking about uh, architecture having like a specific uh, conditions, uh, put it in some way, that we have to work and consider when we make a, a project that maybe I would add another different uh, words. I know it depends of the, on the interest of uh, everyone, but the thing is that it is my impression that you on purpose have put into brackets like architectural design to focus on collateral effects. And uh, while, while you were exposing all these cases, I was thinking all the time that there was a very irregular architectural quality. Well, quality in architectural design is, uh, for example, the first one in Italy for me is much more interesting as an architectural device or design than the others. Um, also, I was thinking that we have not only constant, but also when you work about the champ, uh, both in art and architecture, we have like a very rich culture of dispositive and artifacts for exhibitions and elicit that work with uh, the experience of the uh, subjects or the public. Uh, um, and not only in phenomenological ways, but um, very complex approach about also like accessibility, about uh, civil rights and everything you were talking about, uh, how being in urban space allows uh, bringing discussion about the city and urban space to it. And also the borders, the limits. I, I mean, there is like a lot of very specific disciplinary tools, mm -hmm. or architectural design, basic uh, systems or that could be used in these pavilions. And at the end, there is like a very simple and reduced experience of what a pavilion uh, could be or bring to the city. And I was wondering if uh, doesn't uh, the poor architectural quality, in my opinion, of uh, Saha Hadid uh, have, have a relation with his destiny. I mean that doesn't architectural design influence uh, what is happening to the species that uh, at the end they are not really by no meaningful? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in a way, it is, uh, if it's, well, if it's a disciplinary conversation or is it that side of a conversation? So I'm, um, on the one hand, I don't operate as a designer, but then I bring to the table uh, um, examples that are um, from very well-known architects. Mm -hmm. And that probably is important to kind of uh, try to uh, address some questions that could be more marginal through uh, examples of uh, architecture that everyone will understand. Um, on a way, what we are trying to discuss today, I think all these questions are part of the discipline and no longer uh, in, in the side. Mm -hmm. The second, this idea of um, what you call like poor architectural responses uh, or, I don't know. Uh, what I will say is that uh, probably the responses to experimentation somehow, whatever that term means, are very much mediated and influenced by also the context in which we operate. So in the Serpentine Pavilion, to put an example, the uh, idea of experimentation is uh, connected to the possibility of the gallery to sell the pavilion after the, the summer. If that possibility wouldn't like, be there, probably the ideas of architecture 
will be different because they wouldn't need an object that will be <coughs> able to be sold to a collector and be collected elsewhere. If the, 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 we will embrace the idea that after the summer, maybe not, nothing ex lasts or everything lasts, in, it stays in place, then probably the responses that architects will have to the commission will be different. Mm -hmm. So somehow the idea of experimentation that the Serpentine Pavilion uh, are ex exporting is an idea that is connected or totally implicated with the logics of the art market mm -hmm. in the sense of the collectors or the object that has to be collected. And somehow that has an impact in uh, how uh, what it was the site of experimentation for architects and where the pavilions are now conceived. And I think that's why, to me, uh, there is a lack of uh, interesting ideas, architectural ideas and strategies in any of those uh, projects. So how do you escape that, uh, that, that uh, particular relation? Well, I mean, if uh, Thumtor uh, was able to not to have a cafe, that actually is what brings a lot of uh, uh, yeah, yeah. support to the project, then it might be a possibility to have other conversations, but uh, it's also part of our discussion. I disagree with you in the uh, this statement that the Serpentine Pavilions, I, I understand that uh, you, you your statement in this case is really that it's more from the work of art and not from the work of architecture because the architecture is uh, maybe too uh, much mediated by this uh, art uh, commercial work. But I think that in architecture, uh, this is part of the program. When uh, if I'm, I'm an architect and uh, they asked me uh, to uh, to work in a project that is a temporary pavilion in the Serpentine Gallery to the Serpentine Gallery with some conditions that are part of the program, it's the same as uh, when I have to work in a to build the, uh, to build a house in which the program have, are completely different in many ways. So I uh, I agree uh, with you that. For me, in my opinion, some uh, works in the Serpentine Pavilions are uh, like um, uh, lost opportunities for architects uh, to uh, experiment with uh, architectural with uh, architectural ideas. But I think that there are another example, some some of the pavilions that are clearly. Uh, examples of uh, the work of uh, uh, architects, and not only architects, artists for example. I'm thinking now about the work of the uh, the pavilion of uh, Olaf Urelias on with Esmojeta team. Uh, I think that if you uh, um, uh, analyze uh, the, this project and some other projects of even Esnojeta or uh, Olaf uh, Eliasson, uh, they are uh, very connected. Uh, so uh, I'm thinking, for example, about the Opera House in uh, Oslo, uh, in which is a work of Esnojeta, but with some collaborations of uh, Olaf Eliasson. And uh, I, I find some uh, uh, relationship with, the, with the, the pavilion of the Serpentine. I don't know in a formal way, but yes, uh, with the, there are some concepts, some very architectural concepts that I can translate uh, from one to, to another. So this uh, uh, clear uh, difference uh, uh, stating that uh, pavilions are too commercial, I think that is not uh, really a reason to state after this, this is not architecture. No, I don't say that it's not architecture, it's not the architecture in which I am interested, like to put it bluntly. Mm -hmm. So in the sense that, um, I, I agree with you, um, but then I think that's interesting actually, what you're bringing to the table, maybe it's at the core of this uh, conference, that uh, to me, if for you, what is interesting about, for instance, the pavilion of Esnoeta and Olaf von Eliasson, is that some of the things that were uh, tested in that pavilion then were applied in another pe place, rather than other things that I could name after, then maybe we are talking about this autonomy of architecture that is uh, continuously been uh, uh, finding its reasons in it, in architecture that itself. Mm -hmm. So to me, what happens is that, yeah, that could be valuable. No, it's not, and I talk, okay, 
from a personal point of view. It's not the architecture in which I am interested, mm -hmm. because I understand the architecture that is somehow responding to a larger context of social, political, and cultural mm -hmm. concerns. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, probably, then you can analyze the opera in Oslo and then we'll come <coughs> up with uh, beautiful uh, connections. But in that sense, if I will have the opportunity to to work, and it's not that connected to, uh, that is connected to the market. I think that the, the way in which we respond to the market is quite um, naive, in a way. So I will embrace it. If it, at the core of the uh, commission of the circuit type pavilion is that you have to have a cafe, mm -hmm. maybe you just have to have some drones flying, bringing you cafe from the closest shop. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like, so there will be, uh, an, and that's, uh, research that is being done in the Zurich. So it's not that it's in the outside of architecture, it's at the core of architectural experimentation, whether you find it interesting or not. Yes. So I'm missing that type of engagement with the question. So if you are working in that space that is not only a park, it's a park that is a particular space in the, uh, London, in London there is a city that has been extremely gentrified and is under a pressure, a pressing uh, processes of uh, like expulsion of a lot of populations because of the coming of, of, of finance um, and real estate speculation and so on. And you find yourself as an architect responding to that commission. Probably you can find a way of addressing other issues with the capacity that as architects, editors, critics, and so on, everything that I think forms the, the core of what we do in a different way. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it's my personal um, opinion. So in the sense I say opinion clearly because it's not just it's an opinion. The problem is the commission and they don't know because they, the commission is not very interesting, but they ask the architect and then they choose architect that don't have a critical approach that, that will be the, the that will be the, what excuse us and will be, but then I think there is always ways to respond to a bad commission and there are yes. examples. Yes, but the, if they choose like a, a critical architect. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, then you can claim then another question, like I think there are two women that have been selected to do the Serpentine mm -hmm. Pavilion in the last uh, 15 years and so on and so forth. So there's also about the, the selection. That's another question, I think, like, how the commission is uh, organized, that is still there. I think, well, no, in, in that sense, place, I think, uh, for me, the question is, uh, what is the translation of uh, the information about one side from the other side to be more uh, effects in architecture or in or supports that we have? And I think it's very clear today the example of the toilet, no, that we, uh, because we, if we have the, 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 a lot of power, if we can translate some, doesn't matter if it's a critical uh, uh, exposition or, or exposition or a video games or a artistic uh, situation, but who we can translate something of that and translate to be more effective in one way. I think it's super, in the toilet, we have a, a, the same example where we dream. We dream sometimes that we go to the bathroom, no? And in one second of difference, we get wet, no? when we are a child, or I don't know if... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but this kind of line that the effect is so powerful, because and we translate something that it's not... Perhaps we say that it's not real, and it's real, that it's a dream, and something that is physical, and it's a reality. And if we can to translate this information to the other side, I think it's so powerful. And, and I think it's sometimes it's independence of the quality or the interior discussion that we have sometimes no, in our discipline or these kind of things that we speak all about us no? yeah. and not so about the, this kind of effective effects. No? I, I just when you say like translate, what, what do you mean translate? Uh, to transport one information to the other uh, language. No? In relation to that, I just want to make a comment on the name of the panel. Because for me, after, after listening to the presentations, it seems that we we failed with the name, uh, and it, sh it it shouldn't have been called side effect, but for me, they are more like um, experiments uh, set aside, yeah. like um, kind of isolating certain conditions of architecture that are not so evident if you if you look at them from the core of the discipline, and then. Um, 
as long as we want to be um, experimental, we always uh, propel ourselves through the periphery uh, to look to the center, no? and every paper has placed itself in, the, in this periphery. So um, I would raise the question, is it possible to be experimental from the core? Maybe the name of the panel should have been Special Effects. <laughs> <laughs> I think another interesting, interesting point would be that in this effort of the architect to move uh, farther from, from the core to explore different things and to somehow abandon the permanence of architecture in view of a more engaged, uh, generic conversation, basically. And I think it, in, the, in my mind it has to do with us following following the history of art, always some steps behind, so from modern art, conceptual art, and relational art, we somehow, the periphery of architecture has gravitated towards that sort of historic pull very strongly. But now what I think is more fascinating, and I really don't have an answer for, is how architects doing that type of work seem to be closer and close, closer to the, um, to the actual center of things, like for instance, uh, Andres Hake receiving the Kisler Prize, which is amazing for this young British uh, studio that received the Turner Prize. That was, uh, so I think what that name it would be, I, I think we, we somehow lack the capacity to see why people outside of the world of architecture find these uh, sort of more experimental, immaterial, engaged, and critical practices. Uh, how, how, how do they find them so central when, when for us, it's been an effort to, to come somehow drift away from the center? Mm -hmm. I, I no, and uh, regarding to what you said, I, I also wanted to, to point out that in, in your two papers, maybe there's the question underneath of who is being represented and who has the right to speak. Maybe next to what Spivak says, if, if subalterns can speak. Because when we are looking at, at art or at video games uh, worlds, maybe we are not looking at the the latest or the... the um, we are not transported transporting the most qualitative examples. For example, in the world of video games, if, if you look at the, like the new tendency in independent games that is post-dramatic video games, they do not have a narrative at all. So maybe less narratives means less corridors. So the kind of architecture that this, these games, like in GDC and in Cologne or in, uh, in Los Angeles, they're, they're not basing their, their video games in, in an objective or a, or they are much more autoreferential, and maybe those examples uh, also deal with an idea of architecture that is even nearer to to the contemporary. No, like they don't they don't have so many doors, or they do not have so many windows, and maybe that's near to us. And uh, maybe from in the world of art, because like they are also dealing in the last documental in the Huguenot project or in the Mary's work project from Woman Watching, no? that is a, a very similar example to yours in which one front door is, is disappearing and, and we can get to see what normally we hide at home. They're dealing with the domestic in the world of art, uh, asking themselves what is the difference between home and, uh, and house. And they're, uh, I think they're taking into account much more the user than maybe architects sometimes uh, forget. No? We see a lot models without not a, the intervention of the human, and maybe we can we can learn from that. How do they deal with the performativity of the user? And because I don't know somehow, I know in this example from the woman watching that is very similar to yours. In the end, they burn the house, like as an attempt to say, like there's no there's no user that can accumulate with this relationship with the objects and the communal meeting and open homes, homes up is not possible. I don't know, like, yeah. Can I answer you in Spanish? Because I think that I'm going to do that. No, sobre el tema de los pasillos, eh, ya me habéis preguntado más de una manera, ¿no? <risa> y bueno, eh, una investigación, solo os he contado una, una pequeña parte. ¿Pero la ¿no? planta la has dibujado tú? Sí. Y entonces, bueno, que... Eh, es una pequeña parte, ¿no? Y luego hay como las otras cinco características, ¿no? Y hay otras características que también eh, justifican ¿no? el uso de los pasillos. ¿no? Por ejemplo, una es eh, la incertidumbre. ¿no? Los juegos eh, tienen que ser, ser siempre inciertos, ¿no? O sea, porque si ya sabes de antemano vas a ganar 
pues es de antemano que vas a perder, no tiene ningún, ningún sentido, ¿no? Entonces, por ejemplo, en este caso, en este videojuego que os Pero mostrado, hay juegos en los que no se gana ni se pierde. ¿Mm? Sí, también hay juegos en los que no se gana. No, pero tiene que haber como cierta interacción, ¿no? Entonces, eh, eh, pues Contra la jugadora, has tenido suerte. Sí. <risa> es que estoy diseñando un videojuego. <risa> Y, y bueno, no, pues en el caso, de, en el caso este eh, que os mostraba, ¿no? es una comisaría de policía ¿no? que está llena de zombies ¿no? que van lentos. ¿no? Y apenas que van lentos. Que van lentos como ¿no? la policía. No están. <risa> y entonces, eh, eh, claro, eh, la incertidumbre, pues el, lo que te genera la incertidumbre es que tienes un pasillo largo en el que te vienen eh, zombies lentos que poco a poco se van acercando a ti y cada tienes una sensación más claustrofóbica. ¿no? Pero al de unos años, en, una, en un número posterior del mismo, del mismo viejo, los zombies empezaron a correr. Entonces los espacios cambiaron, cambiaron completamente, ¿no? De repente ya no eran pasillos, sino eran lugares eh, abiertos en los que te podían atacar desde distintos sitios. ¿no? Entonces no solo por el hecho de las narrativas, por, el que, por lo que va todo sobre pasillos, ¿no? sino también por el hecho de la incertidumbre. En cambio, el viejo, que es, otro de los viejos que os mostraban, que era el, el GTA San Andreas, eh, tú tienes como una ciudad completa ¿no? en la que tú puedes realizar un montón de actividades eh, sin que nada, nada te vaya andando, ¿no? pero a medida que vas avanzando en la historia vas pasando inevitablemente por ciertos puntos que, que, no, puedes, que no puedes evitar si quieres concluir con, con el título. ¿Eso quiere decir que los juegos están recorriendo la historia de la arquitectura y han pasado en 10 años del pasillo a la planta libre? <risa> pues, ¿vale? Perdona mi escepticismo de padre. Pero... Hay, hay, no sé, ahora mismo, por ejemplo, en la Trenal de Milán, una de las exposiciones es sobre videojuegos y eh, hay ejemplos como Tale of Tales o Santa Rayone, eh, que no solo hacen ese, ese bridge de la arquitectura, sino hay uno que son 20 segundos, es la historia del cristianismo. Es bastante gracioso. Y eh, la, sí. el, el, a, ¿Incluyen de alguna forma el, el jugador o el, el que tiene la experiencia como co-creador? Y eso es algo que el arquitecto, por ejemplo, igual... Tiene. A mí se me parece una idea, es, es, me parece que hay una relación entre el videojuego y la arquitectura. En cierto lado, la arquitectura se ha provocado eh, su deriva hacia el videojuego al ir subiendo cada vez más eh, pura imagen al ir teniendo cada vez más por imagen, menos espacio, menos, menos implicaciones sociales, sino simplemente imágenes, 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 finalmente podría ser 100% virtual. Y por otro lado me parece muy interesante la forma en la que determinados dispositivos, como por ejemplo un videojuego, los móviles, etcétera, etcétera, pero que en este caso un videojuego moldean nuestra forma de percibir o incluso moldean nuestro cerebro o nuestra idea con la que nos vamos a enfrentar al espacio en adelante. Y esto es, un, es algo que todavía está muy inicial, ¿no? pero va a haber generaciones de, de usuarios de arquitectura que han sido formados en videojuegos. Y la forma en la que eso puede afectar su propia percepción de la arquitectura, esa inmediatez con la que todo tiene que ser percibido y consumido, me parece que va a ser de mucho peso en un futuro inmediato. Y ese comentario es súper interesante porque cuando estás contando bueno, yo me he hecho aquí de marcos programáticos o pactos programáticos. Pra pragmáticos. Uh, pragmáticos. Y me veré. So, like the idea that uh, the designer of the video game has to establish a connection with existing work, a world, whatever that means, in order to make the player feel that uh, somehow they can enter in that experience. So, on the one hand, there are differences between the The, the other space where the player is and the game. And uh, somehow I was connected to what Luis was saying about the history of architecture. It's a very pop experience. So you can notice that like, suddenly the video game has to uh, appeal to the public. So the architecture of the video game is some sort of like, I don't know, like vernacular pop uh, uh, architecture that is uh, meant to for the different players to somehow confirm that they are in a castle or confirm that they are in a house in the middle of the countryside. So suddenly those are architectural topologies are stabilized in the video game while it will be actually the place for more architectural experimentation. So that was, if I follow your presentation thinking about these kind of facts, 
or some agreements between those spaces is what is to me more uh, interesting because I will claim that rather the opposite, like it would be so interesting to work on architectures that doesn't exist anywhere and, and have it as test uh, sites. But following what you said, actually, now that the uh, even in like also in the real estate world and uh, these kind of dispositives and devices that you put the virtual reality and more and more architectural offices have to uh, respond to that space and um, mm. uh, design for that particular moment where the client is going to put the glasses and is going to experience the space where it is like mm. with zombies that go very fast or with zombies that go very slow but probably has an impact in the way we also design in the way because has a, an impact in the way we experience that, that virtual space that is the space that ultimately uh, is going to be sold, not longer the floor plan. Yeah, so, yeah. The, thing, the thing is that you are, at the end of the day, you have to decide whether you want to go at the core, you say, then then we go with with the body and zoom <laughs> no? So that's that's the core. So that you, you cannot have coffee, you have to be thirsty because you have to concentrate on, on the purity of things, nature, architecture, texture, etc. Or else you have to go to the to the border of things, in which that's where we are trying to think uh, through that then you have the video games, then you have the virtuality, then you and but the problem is that the, the, the extremes of the virtuality they immediately go back. Because we have uh, uh, we are trapped in this this issue of time. Is it uh, uh, this this uh, very beautiful book by this uh, 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 professor at Harvard that uh, 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 wrote the book on memory? And 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 uh, one of the things she says, which is it's like in the video games, uh, is that our problem with memory is our, uh, our memory of the future. Uh, leads to the past, and she put. Uh, there are very many examples, like in video games, that you go to the future and you find yourself in the, in the Middle Ages. But uh, the the in movies, which are have become part of our uh, uh, our minds and uh, and references of our minds, there are many. You know, return to the future. But most importantly, the one of the uh, 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 Jurassic Park which uh, she works in the book very, very extensively. And it's a very interesting thing, is that in Jurassic Park, when you want to have an experience of the future, you go back, not to the human past, but, but to the geological past. So the experience of the future is the experience of the origins of things, uh, which has been, have been virtually recreated through science, like digital games, uh, in which all you get is the I guess it's what you call the uh, the sensation or the perception of of of, uh, uh, of something that is entertaining. That's all we require. It's like uh, the serpentine pavilions; they have to be entertaining. And entertainment is always, you know, it lasts for a day, and uh, and then you have to go to sleep, and then they take out the the serpentine gallery pavilion, which at the end of it, because we, because it's it's on the edge of things, things are in order to entertain. As the nature, they have to end in the fantalas, in the, in the uh, parque attracciones. So, so you know, the, the problem with with your question is, can we can we experiment at the core of things? Can we can we produce new things in the core of things? Is that the, 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 I'm going back to Bidler and Foucault? At the core of things, we have a tribunal de las pacas. At the core of things, they have no no question about whether architecture has to change. No. But the real have. challenge is to bridge what mm -hmm. is uh, in the core and what, what is not. If, if we would yeah. agree that uh, what she was talking about is the core, which I don't <laughs> I think that uh, everything is in the core now or should be. And the challenge is to bridge all mm -hmm. this question together. And I think I really think that it is a handicap to try to separate or define a core again. No, the experiment with the core is uh, like uh, what Anthony Bidler did in his final statement in the conference about typology. Uh, he was like trying to inject all the new uh, demands uh, that are uh, stretching architecture. Uh, thinking into something which is very disciplinary like the word typology. Maybe 
it's, it was not elaborated enough, but I think the real challenge is, is to bring these things that we cannot see yeah, them like opposite, because uh, at the end there is a relation between them. Sus Susanna was talking about the core, I think, because she was talking about the body. I don't want to make a uh, uh, game with words, but uh, this is the, the issue of whether we're talking in architecture for one body, mm -hmm. for the body, for one person, its perception, its private world, and then we end in the house of laws. We, we end in the private bourgeois house. We have to, that's it. That's, that's its environment, that's its context. Or we build, we think, we experiment for everybody. And then uh, we disappear as authors, as producers, and, 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 and we accept becoming part of a system that has, you know, that has a fluidity and a, and, a, and a capacity and a strength of the stream that does not allow for, for, for that kind of position. And then when they have to create uh, an exhibition on Latin America, they say, who comes to, to the exhibition? And they say, everybody. Everybody in politics, not, not the body, not, not, only not somebody, but everybody. It's not only a logical question, it's also a political um, matter. For what, some what, what is the body? What is the, defi the definition of the body? Maybe it's a community, maybe it's a female or a well, male or a. Well, we, we, we say that the body is everybody, and we change the word. So, yes, we can. But we can there is a lot of new inputs in the question of the body that are not uh, like only poetical or 